Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm here with Dr. Paul Slovic. He is a founder and president of Decision Research and professor of psychology at the University of Oregon, where he studies human judgment, decision making, and risk analysis. He and his colleagues worldwide have developed methods to describe risk perceptions and measure their impacts on individuals, industry, and society. Dr. Slovic is a past president of the Society for Risk Analysis. He is also the recipient of several awards, and he was also elected for, uh, to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2015 and the National Academy of Sciences in 2016. So, Dr. Slovic, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. My pleasure, Ricardo. Looking forward to talking with you. Oh, it's my pleasure. O okay, so let me first ask you, because I guess that a lot of the work that you do is based on how people process information, uh, on how people are affected by certain types of information they are exposed to, and how their decision-making processes work when they are exposed to those types of information, let's say. And so it is also uh, based on biases and heuristics, right? So, uh, I mean, e even in today's society, uh, in a scientific modern world, wouldn't you say that perhaps these biases and heuristics that people are subject to might still have some value at least some of the time, or do they always lead to uh, negative consequences? Yes, very interesting uh, question. I, I think another way to phrase your question um, would be, does scientific information have value for us in a world where we are still um, mostly dependent on these uh, ancient forms of, of thinking that uh, right. lead to heuristics and biases? So, so uh, yeah, it's a, there's a, a lot of uh, things that come to mind with regard to your question. So. We, we think in, in two ways. We know that uh, one is uh, kind of intuitive and using our kind of gut feelings, and the other is a kind of analytic based on, on uh, logic, reason, scientific, scientific information. But that's a more recent uh, development of the human brain to be able to think that way. And the, the survival of the human species throughout the period of evolution depended mostly on this uh, intuitive uh, gut feeling type of, of thinking. And that's still very much with us today and, and influencing us a lot. I was just uh, listening to a disturbing story on, on the news this morning uh, about uh, uh, protests uh, by people who, believe, who, who were worried that they were going to be forced to vaccinate their, their children against uh, uh, diseases because they they fear vaccination to be uh, harmful, uh, even though it's scientifically shown to be really not only quite safe but extremely beneficial. And yet, yet their their fears are such that uh, they are you know out in the streets uh, protesting against being forced to vaccinate their children. Well, I think this is an example of the the tension between our kind of intuitive fears and what uh, the world of science tells us, and it's very much uh, uh, present today and, and influencing us in this, this dynamic uh, is, is very important to understand in trying to uh, think about, well, you know, what is rational, what is not, how should uh, society respond when, when people are making uh, judgments and decisions based on this uh, intuitive uh, feeling sense as opposed to what uh, data and science tells them. So this is kind of a, uh, a dynamic that's being played out today uh, as it has for, for many uh, thousands of years. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I guess that we're going to go back to this question later in the interview that is perhaps the relationship between lay people and the experts, but I guess that uh, it is also very difficult for people nowadays in this world where we have a lot of information from different areas. I mean, it is very difficult for people to really have a good grasp of the relevant information from all these different areas and perhaps we could talk about politics or the environment or even scientific disciplines including medicine and vaccination and things like that and to really evaluate them properly i mean and on the other hand we have the experts but sometimes perhaps people are a bit afraid of relying too much on the experts and they feel like they are being uh, pa patronized or something like that. So, I mean, it's a bit difficult to deal with all of these complex issues, right? Yes. There's a sense in which we, we have more information available to us today than, than ever before. So we have to be selective in what, uh, what we pay attention to. And what we're finding is that, that people are selecting information that makes them feel good and and uh, conforms what they what they do believe and what they want to believe and what their friends believe so there's that's the confirmation bias correct yes yes and and also kind of a cultural what we call what some uh, scholars like uh, dan kahan at the yale law, law school have called cultural cognition that our that our thinking is is um, uh, directed by our, our cultural uh, ideologies and predispositions, so that we we tend to uh, to relate to people who are like us, and we we share information and ideas and beliefs with people who are like us and who who reinforce our beliefs. And we you know we all feel good about that, and then we sort of together oppose uh, the other groups that think differently from us. And there's a lot of of, uh, of uh, conflict that is generated there. And it's very hard to, to uh, penetrate that with information. We, we find that you know, when new information comes out, that the, the different, the different uh, ideological groups uh, interpret that information in different ways, you know, it's supportive of their beliefs. You know, it, doesn't bring pe it doesn't necessarily bring people together as we would hope it would, rather it uh, they, it is spinned and, and reflected and reinforced in ways that, that amplify one's beliefs in, or maybe even uh, further the polarization. So that's kind of a, that's a very worrisome situation, uh, which I think is prevalent today. Maybe it's, it's always been with us to a sense, but never quite in the same way because the, the nature of where we get our information has changed so much in this digital world, you know, like you and I are talking together for thousands of miles apart over digital technologies. Um, in the past, we would have been writing letters to each other. <laughs> right, and they would have taken a few weeks to arrive or even months, right? Right, and we would you know, think carefully. You know, if you get a letter, you spend a lot of time thinking about it and crafting a, a, a thoughtful reply, and you know, those days seem to be uh, gone. Mm -hmm. Yes, so let me ask you, do you think that the approach that some people have, like for example Daniel Kahneman, of thinking of things and separating them between system one and system two, or perhaps uh, fast and slow thinking processes, or intuitive knowledge and reflective knowledge, whatever you want to call them, that that is a useful approach and I'm also asking you this because I don't know if this makes sense but uh, when I think about these things like for example the fact that even when people are a little bit more reflective uh, about their decisions and things like that many times what happens is that even their uh, reflective processes are influenced by intuitions and sometimes decisions that people make and justifications to those decisions that they come up with are sort of post hoc 
rationalization. So uh, I'm not sure if it is really that easy to make a strict division between the two types of systems, but I, I might be mistaken, so. Yes, very important question. So the word system is a bit co controversial because it, it um, implies a very you know, tightly uh, coordinated set of, of uh, responses that can all be linked to a system when it's not quite it's not that 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 simple as you're hinting the the I think that the the concept of fast and slow thinking that Kahneman has described is is very important and very very useful although it's not a a hard and fast and completely separate thing I mean I think that that uh, you know where does the line is the line drawn between between a fast response and a slow response you know there's no quite answer to that but it but I think it captures the notion that sometimes we we receive information, we respond very quickly. Sometimes even in a in a small fraction of a second, you know, we we formulate a response or an action to a, to a something that comes to our attention. That's you know that's really really fast microseconds. Uh, we uh, the brain responds and we sense something is good or bad or we need to you know run away or or do something, and 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 we're all familiar with thinking hard and thinking slowly about some problem and trying to, you know, to calculate well, you know, something that's uh, that's really takes um, hard hard thought, and we have to think about reasons. Like if you're going to buy a car, you know, and you're looking and and the, the car is different differ in different ways, and you know, do you want um, um, uh, how important is safety and fuel economy and cost and all these sorts of things, and and so we might want to do some analysis there. Although again, the fast part of the you know responding because we like the red color <laughs> real quickly is also there. So both of these ways of responding um, are continually active in our brain, kind of uh, in what we call uh, the dance of affect, which is. Uh, jargon for feeling, the dance of affect and reason. They're dancing around in our brain and, and influencing us in ways that, that those of us who study this are trying to understand better. We, we know something about it, but there's a lot we need to know. So yes, I think that's a very important concept and I use, it's very important in, in my work trying to understand um, uh, important behaviors. Maybe we'll discuss some of those later. On the other hand, so, so what, we, what we know is that both fast and slow thinking are highly sophisticated. I would say that they are rational uh, ways of, of uh, thinking. What do I mean by rational? That's a loaded word. Um, and for, for me, uh, uh, a rational response is a response that helps, that helps, uh, helps a person uh, achieve their objectives. You know, whatever those objectives are, you may not agree with those objectives, but if, if it gets them where they want to go, it's rational for them. And, and so I think both of these ways of thinking are highly rational. The, the, uh, the fast thinking helped us survive through, you know, aeons of evolutionary uh, history. Um, and, you know, it, it, it worked well enough that we're still, we're still here. And the slow thinking you know, can do, you know, can do, create miracles. You can create these aluminum tubes that fly through this air at hundreds of miles an hour and, you know, 30,000 feet. It can get us uh, to people on the moon or spacecraft on Mars or these sorts of things. So, so both ways of thinking are essential and, and valuable. Uh, however, both of them uh, have um, limitations. And, and they break down in certain situations. And so that's what I think is the important thing to try to understand is when can we uh, rely on and trust the fast mode? Wh where does it and how does it fail us? The same thing with the, the slow thinking, as you were pointing out, you know, there are ways in which slow thinking can lead us astray. And, and what we talked about a little earlier, where we take information and we spin it to confirm our belief, that's slow thinking, uh, which you know perverts information and and you know doesn't really treat it for its real evidentiary value. So so both ways of of that are 
that our brain processes information are miraculous in, in, in many ways. And they both have, have flaws and limitations and we need to understand both the benefits and the, and the flaws of each type of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting that you refer to what you consider to be rational behavior and basically you said that it is something that allows a particular person or perhaps a society or a collective to arrive at their goals. So I would like to ask you if you don't think that perhaps the ways by which we classify things as biases, for example, if sometimes they don't have, uh, if that classification sometimes doesn't have a sort of a moralistic side to it, in the sense that uh, we first establish, either individually or collectively, what we consider to be uh, good or bad goals or good or bad outcomes and then according to that we see what are the sorts of ways of thinking that people have that lead toward uh, bad outcomes or good outcomes and the ones that lead them astray are the ones that we classify as biases. I mean, I'm not sure if this makes sense, but... Yes, it does. So first I would say that, that the word bias uh, basically doesn't have this inherent, uh, doesn't necessarily have to have this good or bad element to it. A bias is a, is a deviation from some, from some expected uh, value. So, uh, and that is not necessarily bad, it's what it is that, you know, you, you, you think that, that uh, if people think that the uh, uh, temperature today is, uh, you know, such and such degrees Celsius, and no, in fact, it's, it's uh, one degree higher. Well, their judgment is biased in that sense, but that doesn't mean it's really bad or harmful. I mean, it's just a, it's just a, a deviation. But I think that you're right that in the, the uh, underlying, the work that uh, began to be, uh, be done uh, in 1960s or 70s on biases, there was the thought that, that some of these could be uh, dangerous or harmful. You know, that if you underestimated the likelihood uh, that uh, something is going to cause harm, then you wouldn't protect adequately against it, things like that. So, um, so yes, there was the implication that these biases were problematic, and there's been now thousands of studies of all kinds of biases uh, uh, in you know, the last three or four years. And I think some of them are truly um, uh, harmful, and others are just, this is the way people think, and, you know, it's not necessarily good or bad, but it's interesting. Uh, what it, you know. So, so there, there's been a, a lot of work, uh, obviously, done on this. And some people felt that this field was, was biased towards finding biases. Well... Yes, it was, but it was on the, uh, the assumption that, you know, we need to know this. Uh, we need to, we, uh, who was it, Socrates said, you know, know thyself. And, uh, and, you know, the work in this field is trying to get us to understand ourselves and the, and the kind of the strange ways that our minds react when, in, you know, when we take in information and try to use it. Uh, and uh, I personally feel that I'm studying ways that we are biased that are truly, truly harmful uh, to the world and that we need to understand and do something about it. Mm -hmm. So just before we move on to talk about other concepts like bounded rationality and risk and risk perception and things like that, uh, I wouldn't like to go on a tangent here and talk too much about this, but let me just ask you before we move on, uh, don't you think that perhaps uh, fast processes of thinking or thought uh, are useful to people 
at least in the social environment or the social world because I mean in order for people to really be fluid in their interactions they have to process information that they receive from other people in a very fast way and if they didn't do that if they were deliberative all the time then perhaps it would be very awkward and people uh, and their interactions would be perhaps more difficult because I mean if I am exposed to someone uh, uh, that is part of a group uh, about which I have a very particular type of stereotype for example it might lead to negative consequences if I'm acting automatically but I mean in terms of the personal interaction wouldn't it be very difficult for people uh, to keep normal social interactions if they were trying to uh, be uh, completely aware of the ways they think and classify other people and try to be deliberative about it or, or don't you agree with that uh, yes i i agree i mean i i can't see us walking around with with uh, little calculators uh, or little computers where we we see someone and we enter into the computer all the the features that we see about that person and we get a score as to you know whether we should go up and say hello to them or not, or you know whether it's or we should cross the street and get away from them. I mean, clearly we we have we have learned uh, ways of of uh, reacting to our social environment uh, through experience. A lot of it is taught by by experience, and and once you have experienced something, you get a very fast reaction that is kind of coded in by what happened the last time when I saw a person like this. Um, and so, again, that can be valid or, or not, but uh, that's the way we operate. We, we, we do learn from our, we, and we are experiencing things, obviously, from the day we we're born, and, and then those are coded into very uh, fast, uh, fluid uh, reactions, which uh, enable us to function uh, in, in society. And now, sometimes these reactions might be might be wrong. We might be taught, for example, to be prejudiced towards some people, you know, and then that's the way we respond quickly without thinking about, well, you know, why should we do this? You know, who are, you know, are these people really different and bad, you know, uh, because they don't look like us or whatever, you know, so, so uh, it can be, uh, you know, harmful uh, reaction, but it's, but you're right, it's fast and fluid. And, we just don't, we don't uh, do these kind of calculations uh, very often. The, the default, Kahneman in his book, Fa Thinking Fast and Slow said, is that the default mode of thinking is the fast uh, intuitive system, which is based on images, thoughts, uh, heavily uh, uh, associated with feelings, positive, negative feelings or emotions, you know, and this is, um, I, I liken this to a, to a compass. The fast system is our is our compass. It, it helps us go through our day. You know, we rely on it all, all the time. So, let's say I have a I have a uh, an assignment due at three o'clock in the afternoon, and it's noon. I, you know, I still have a lot of work to do on it. It's noon time, and I'm hungry. Should I, you know, work through lunch in order to increase the chances of meeting the deadline? Or should I satisfy my hunger and, and increase the, the, the probability that I might not get the assignment done in time? How do I make that decision? I don't sit down with a pencil and paper and think about what economists would say the, the utility uh, of, of having lunch now and the utility of having my assignment done on time and what are the probabilities of success or failure and then multiplying those utilities by their probabilities to get at some expected uh, uh, value that I compare the expected value of eating lunch uh, and the expected value of, of um, me meeting my obligation and not eating lunch and see which is higher and then go for the higher and that's kind of the old the original notion is the maximization of expected utility with some form of, of calculations that we do well we do that fast and fluidly you know our brains do those calculations you know, in, in, in seconds, you know, 
we just get a, a, a thought about you know eating, a thought about meeting our deadline, and and the neurons in our brain um, blend those in ways that we don't fully understand. You know, people think maybe this is this has to do with the way um, uh, uh, neurons, the dopamine uh, transmission in neurons, does these calculations for us, you know, quickly, and then and then we do it, but we don't sit down and 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 wrestle with this in in a slow in a very slow thing. We make it quickly. So we and and most of the time these things work. I mean, most of us we get through the day. And think about driving. All the decisions you make it in driving, where you've learned from experience, you're not calculating risks and benefits of uh, you know different uh, um, actions in the car. You've learned how to do this very uh, fast and, and quickly. You have to. So so the uh, this way of thinking is phenomenal, and we rely on it uh, all, uh, all the time. And and sometimes uh, and most of the time it works. Um, and the same thing with other heuristics. They you know they're 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 useful, but sometimes uh, they uh, they lead us uh, astray, and we need to recognize when that might happen and defend against it. So it's like I mean I, I think it's a bit like uh, uh, visual illusions. So the the human visual system. Is very you know uh, rational, and we, our our eyesight is, our, uh, is not as it's not as good as that of some birds or other creatures, but it's good enough so that when we see something in front of us, usually that's what it is, and we can deal with it, uh, uh, you know, uh, successfully. But but we but the the uh, study of visual illusion shows us that there are certain patterns. Uh, you know, uh, of um, of light and and design on a, on a, you know in front of us that mislead the eye. So we think that A is bigger than B when B is bigger than A. Things like that. Well, well, that shows that the visual system, as good as it is, uh, breaks down in some circumstances. And I think it's the same thing with with this fast intuitive system, which is good. But it breaks down in certain ways, and we need to understand that and deal with it. Mm -hmm. And so, in order to understand that, uh, you've already talked about rationality and what you mean by rational. Uh, could you now explain the concept of bounded rationality and perhaps give a couple of examples where it applies? Well, I think that was a uh, a reaction to what early people in the uh, judgment and decision making field uh, interpreted as assertions from from economics that that people were were rational that they that if they had the proper information they would make decisions that were kind of optimal you know that uh, they were rational in the sense that, that this was this was good and, and optimal and and what uh, Herbert Simon in the 1950s um, told us, and and, and he had uh, experiments to to back this up, was that well, it's not we're not quite that good, you know. Clearly, um, our attention is a, is an important factor in in uh, guiding our behavior, and and we know our, our attention is is limited, our our memories are limited, and so we have to work with certain limitations uh, that are kind of built into the the, the, the human uh, brain and that uh, we can't necessarily optimize and get the highest value out of every decision and he created a concept called uh, satisficing you know that we do things that are good enough uh, even if they're not the absolute best so uh, this is kind of an uh, you know a brief element of, of, uh, of the fact that we are rational but not perfectly maximally rational and I, I certainly think that, that that is a concept that has uh, stood the test of time and I think that we we uh, you know we have shown that the the work on as we learn more about how judgments and decisions are made we see that yes we are not maximizing things in that way we just hope hope that we're doing good enough, and sometimes we do we things that are good enough, and sometimes 
uh, we don't. We're not, you know, we, we need to improve. We need to be better. So, um, I mean, I think, I don't think many people would disagree with the notion that we're not perfectly rational. Um, and so we were maybe using an, a, a kind of an overly idealistic model that we thought economists were putting forth, uh, perfect rationality. Well, okay, it's not the case. Simon helped us, you know, uh, uh, break that barrier. And once you open that, that, that door a little bit, you see all the different ways that we are uh, less than optimal and sometimes uh, seriously so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about risk and risk perception, because I guess that this is very important to introduce this, this theme here, because it will uh, pave the way for us to talk later about uh, health issues and climate issues and things like that. So what would you say first uh, uh, that you would consider to be the most important things for people to know about how humans perceive risk and perhaps that can lead to problems, let's say. Uh, first, what we've learned is that risk is a, is a very complex uh, concept. I mean, it's a simple word. We use it all the time. We think we know what we mean when we, when we uh, use it uh, in a sentence and then the very next sentence we'll, we'll use it in, in a different way, and, and without even realizing that uh, that we're not consistent in, in the meaning of it. So, for, so basically, when you start to think carefully about how it's used, you see that there, there's at least four uh, different meanings that, that we are commonly use. There probably are more, but I, I look at four. The first, we use uh, risk to mean a hazard. Something that can hurt us is a risk. Um, you know, it's, a, it's actually an activity or a technology is a risk um, if it's got harmful consequences. The second way we use it is when we really mean probability. How, how likely, you know, what is the risk of something happening? Uh, we're, we're really implying, what, how likely is it? Uh, a third way is uh, we use it when we mean the, the consequence. I mean, what's the risk of letting my parking meter expire? The risk of letting that expire is a consequence. It's getting a, a ticket, paying a fine. So it's a consequence. And I think that, you know, perhaps the most um, logical uh, meaning of it is a blend of how likely something uh, is to happen and how harmful are the consequences. And some people would say, well, you should uh, take both of those into account by multiplying some value of the consequence by the probability. You have two numbers, you can multiply them. Well, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you don't have the, the probability as a number. Sometimes you don't know the consequence as a number. I mean, sometimes if it's a, say it's a loss of, of an amount of money, you've got a fixed numerical consequence. But most of the time, these, the, the, the probabilities uh, and the consequences are, are fuzzy in our mind. They're diffuse. And so we have to kind of do that kind of multiplication in a fast, intuitive way. Anyway, you see that just from the start, the, the word itself is, is uh, problematic and often used uh, you know, in diverse ways by the same person you know, from one moment uh, to the next. Second, we see that, that, the, that the likelihoods and the values of the consequences, as I mentioned, are not precisely defined. So how do we even know what they are? And so, so there's, there's two ways to know. One is to use this what's system two, this analytic thinking, and to collect data and to calculate frequencies and probabilities and all kinds of you know, numbers to, uh, to indicate how, how, how common or how likely something is to happen. Another is to, is to put a number on the consequence. If it doesn't have already a number like an amount of money, you... Uh, you, you create some, some uh, numerical measure and you do calculations and things like that. So it's kind of a statistical, mathematical uh, approach. So that's one way to, uh, to assess risk. And, and it's very important. And you have people who are very, uh, very good at it. Uh, you know, the physicists, engineers, biologists who can 
actually put numbers on uh, to indicate the riskiness. We have the Society for Risk Analysis, and a major component of that, of the people who belong to that, are, are people who are, are very skilled at quantifying risk with these, you know, uh, formulae and, and equations, either based both on theory and, and, and data. Very, very important. I mean, that's how, uh, you know, engineers design uh, you know, airplanes or other systems. You know, they, they use calculations and which affect the, how the likelihood of some component failing and causing a, uh, a devastating action, accident and so forth. Okay, so we need to do that kind of analysis. But again, uh, going back to the, the, the default in common sense, uh, most of the time we uh, regular people judge risk by our feelings. You know, uh, we we uh, we have a sense of likelihood and severity that that conveys uh, anxiety, worry, or just some sort of negative sense in us, or sometimes fear or uh, sadness, or you know. So so we use our feelings as the as the guide to how risky something is, and. If our feelings have been um, uh, trained by experience, you know, some people are very experienced in, you know, in like the firefighters, for example. They you know they they've done this if they've done this a lot. They know what what behaviors might be more or less risky for them to do in confronting a, a fire, like we had at Notre Dame last uh, last week. Um, you know, you can you you learn by experience. Or other times you just sort of learn it just it's it's just the way things appear to you, um, and your feelings could not be very uh, uh, calibrated with what what is is going on. And so so what I and some of my colleagues do is we try to understand uh, this concept of risk as a feeling. And again, what uh, how does the, how does the brain create feelings? How do these feelings? Influence, influence us. And what we're finding are all kinds of fascinating kind of weirdness about the feeling. The feeling system, again, it's most of the time it works, you know, and especially if it's based on experience that, that has trained our feelings. But other times when the situations are kind of novel or extreme, we haven't had a lot of experience and we just kind of confront the, uh, the situation, then, then the feelings are... I would say biased. <laughs> I'll use that word, uh, and uh, and really, really uh, mis mislead us. So, so, and the the feeling system does perform calculations, you know, that influence how strongly we feel about something, how how worried or anxious or unconcerned, and and we have a, a term uh, for that in what uh, called the the arithmetic of compassion when the feelings have to do with with uh, whether you should go to the aid or rescue someone uh, in uh, at risk, that uh, that these feelings, this is the feeling system does things which are bizarre and I, I would argue uh, non-rational because they don't they don't help us achieve the goal of that we would uh, think we would want to achieve. So. Um, one example of of the the problem the, the feeling system feelings uh, our brain doesn't do arithmetic on feelings, um, um, and w one example comes from an experiment that Christopher She and Yuval Rottenstrike did at University of uh, Chicago a few years ago, when they they had uh, uh, two groups of people, and they told they told these people in this experiment. We're going to expose you to some chance of getting a a strong electric shock. I mean, it won't really harm you, but it, it won't be very. You know, it's a strong shock. Um, how much would you pay to get out of this experiment? <laughs> to, um, up to up to twenty dollars. You can pay up to twenty dollars. What's the most you would pay so you don't have to take part in this weird experiment? And and then they had two groups of people. One group they said. Uh, the n probability of your getting the shock is 99%. The other group they told the probability of getting this shock is 1%. Mm -hmm. The the 1% group 
paid almost as much as the 99% group to get out of the experiment. Uh, they had, they had uh, two other groups where instead of shock, the, the outcome was losing $20. There they found that the 99% group would pay a lot more to get out of the experiment than the 1%. So it wasn't that people couldn't sense probability in, in that way. They, they, uh, they were very sensitive when it was loss of money. When it was getting the shock, they were insensitive to the likelihood. What I think is, how I interpret that experiment is that the way people decided how much to pay uh, was a function of how, they, how anxious they felt about being in that experiment. And I think that anxiety comes from thinking about the shock, the consequence. So you think about the shock and the consequence itself makes you anxious. But then you're told it's a 1% it's a chance or a 99% chance. There's no way that the brain can multiply a feeling of anxiety by a, num by a probability. You know, that, that, that kind of arithmetic calculation doesn't happen. The, the only way you can do it, you, can, you, can, you could do a more calculus, is if you move it, that 1% to zero. And then you know, then, then the feeling goes away. If, it, if you think this is impossible, it's not gonna happen, then you relax. But as long as you entertain that, that thought of getting a shock, you know, it, it's not zero, you're anxious and you'll respond. So that's one example of the, pro the problem of the feelings, you don't, uh, they're, they're, don't do arithmetic very well. And then we found um, in my own research, well, I should go back and say that, that Kahneman and his colleague Amos Tversky, uh, Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002 uh, in economics, even though he's a psychologist. And uh, Amos Tversky, his uh, longtime colleague, would have also uh, shared the prize with him had he not died prematurely in 1996. Uh, so one of the things that they, uh, 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 that they won the prize for was a theory called prospect theory. The, the centerpiece of prospect theory is something that they call the value function. It's how much we value things as the, the amount increases or decreases, and or whether it's a gain or a loss. And so it's kind of a function that's um, with the, the amount is on the, on the x-axis, the, the value is on the, on the y-axis, and, and, and the, the function is nonlinear, uh, let's say for gains, and, and illustrated, say, with, with money. That is, if you, if you, uh, if you gain $100, you'll feel good. It has value for you. If you, uh, if you gain $200, uh, you, won't, you won't perceive that as twice as, it doesn't feel twice as valuable as 100. It's something less than twice. It starts to curve off. You know, and if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a, a, a millionaire, an extra $100, you won't notice it. So that $100 does not have a constant meaning. It, it, it's influenced by how much you already have or where you know the, the amount that you already have so uh, and it kind of flattens up so 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 the function is very steep from around zero and then it flattens out um, we call it a psychophysical function because that's the same way our eyes respond to uh, light energy or our ears respond to sound energy that you know we're very sensitive at small levels and we become insensitive at large levels so in a in a quiet room, you can hear a whisper. You some, that you see the different. You hear something different. In a loud room, you won't hear that risk, whisper. It takes a lot more change in energy for you to notice a difference in sound. It's the same thing with the way we respond to money. And what we've also found is, unfortunately, that's also the way we respond to gains and losses of human lives. That uh, we're we're very sensitive um, uh, about the first life that's in danger or that, that has, uh, you know, we've lost. Zero to one is huge and the function, the value of that is, is large. And then the second, if there are two people at risk, it doesn't feel twice as bad as one. It's something less than twice. And, and by the time you get to 80, 87 lives at risk, and then if I said, oh no, wait a minute, there's 88, you won't feel any different. 
thinking about 88 lives at risk than, than 87. That life, which is so important, if it's the first life, loses its value against the backdrop of a larger um, number of lives. And because the feeling system doesn't add. So if the feeling system adds, then as the number increased, you get a, a straight line, a linear. The, the value of protecting those lives would increase in a straight line. It doesn't do that. It goes up and it flattens out. And at some point, we become insensitive. So, so we hear that, oh, you know, 200,000 people have been uh, murdered in uh, Darfur a few years ago. And then we say, oh, wait, now the, you know, on, on, on the statistics, it may be 400,000. You won't feel any different. 200,000. There's 200,000 more lives. You know, the feeling system can't handle that. It can't. It can't add, and it can't multiply. And so we say that that the that the arithmetic of compassion, feelings, compassionate feelings, is a flawed, deadly arithmetic. It, it is not. It's not a rational arithmetic. And so that and that's that's built into the function of the value of prospect theory that. Uh, has been uh, such a successful theory, but we've taken that a lot further in looking at what the implications are for uh, for catastrophic losses, whether it's due to violence or to disease or you know climate change or whatever. That's that insensitivity. What we've also found, and we and we do experiments. We 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 do experiments in the laboratory. Uh, we uh, we ask give people the opportunity, say, to donate to children who are facing starvation, and we increase the number of children, and we see how what the donation response is. That's how we kind of get some uh, uh, control studies, but then we get a result. We then look and see, does this make sense with what we see going on in the world? So, so for example, uh, in order to test this, this nonlinear uh, uh, theory, we, uh, at the time, we were looking for a, a way to do an experiment on it. And this was in the in the um, middle of the 1990s, uh, just after the the uh, the Rwandan genocide, which uh, took place in 1994. And we saw an article in the newspaper that said that those who survived the genocide fled to refugee camps on the border between Rwanda and what was then Zaire. It's now part of Congo. And they. And they began to suffer from cholera because they didn't have clean water, so they, they, uh, uh, there were epidemics of cholera uh, in, the, in the camp. And so the news article was about the need uh, for people in neighboring countries to supply uh, well drilling and pumping equipment that could create new uh, uh, fresh water supplies in the camp. So we used that uh, as the basis of a, of a scenario in, in an experiment where we told people that imagine you're, you're an official in a neighboring country, you want to help the people in the camp, um, and you, could, you have enough money to provide uh, drilling and pumping equipment to, keep, to provide fresh water to 4,500 people in the camp. But you've got other, other uses for your money. You could, you could spend that money domestically. You could improve your hospitals, your schools, your roads. You know, would, you send, would you spend the money and, and send it to help uh, bring clean water and protect 4,500 people. Uh, and so people made that uh, decision. And then the experiment was we varied uh, two things. We had two groups of people. In one group, we told them that uh, you'll protect 4,500 people. Oh, the camp has 250,000 people in the camp. Second group, you'll protect 4,500 people. <clears throat> the camp has 11,000. Would you would you send it? So people were much more likely to send the money to the camp in the small camp than in the large, because it felt more, uh, more. It was it, it seemed more effective. It, it's on the on the steep part of the curve. That is, you're saving half the people in the camp, whereas going from 250,000 at risk to 245,000 or so didn't didn't seem like it made any difference. But it's the same 4,500 lives, and so that illustrates this nonlinear uh, uh, reaction to number, which is not rational. Because what's rational is it's not the percentage of lives you save; it's the number of lives you save. So that's just one example of how you can do experiments uh, on this uh, uh, to, you know, to test this this nonlinear uh, sense of value for protecting human life. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so that, that's very interesting, and there's lots of things there to unpack. So let's start with this, because I guess that all of the things you just told us about, they have huge implications in several different areas of human activity, like, for example, uh, health and medicine and the environment, and we could pick on two very... Uh, very distinct examples like, for example, GMOs and vaccines, because I guess that, uh, I mean, uh, they are a bit complex in the sense that there are different factors uh, influencing people here. Like, for example, the fact that when they think about GMOs and vaccines, they immediately associate them with artificial things. And then it's very intuitive for people to think that natural things are good and artificial things are bad. And then when people make some poorly designed studies that go viral, like, for example, Andrew Wakefield in the 90s tried to establish a connection or a link between vaccination and autism, and we now know that those studies were really poorly designed, but anyway, they really went viral among people and spread among them, and and it's really... Uh, since they appeal to people's intuitions, it's really hard to go back and to explain them how the science behind vaccination, for example, works, a- and to really uh, try to g- uh, to go around their intuitions and convince them that really things like vaccination don't have problems and then when we go to talk about GMOs for example I mean it's not only a health issue it's also an environmental one and people think that for example organic agriculture is better just because it simply doesn't use pesticides supposedly because in fact it also uses pesticides but I mean when people look at those studies again that were poor designed that supposedly established the link between uh, um, between ingesting GMO uh, food uh, and and the growth of some tumors or cancers and things like that uh, but I, I mean th- and this is where we really also go back to what I was talking about earlier uh, about the conflict between lay people and experts because these are things that really appeal to people's intuitions and people have strong emotional reactions to them and it's very hard because science is counterintuitive to really try to calm people down and to expose them to the correct information uh, to try to to really make them uh, adopt the, that ki- uh, that kind of approach to things a scientific uh, deliberative approach ba- based on critical thinking let's say and the problem here is that uh, these uh, can have very negative influences at a collective or social level. I mean, it's not, it's not that someone as an individual has these ideas and it is only him or her that has to deal with the negative consequences, but these really might have, and particularly in the, ro- in the long run, very, a very negative impact on society, right? So what you're talking about is the the complexity of trying to uh, navigate between a a world of science and a world where you're uh, so much influenced by your your feelings. And again, the the feelings uh, are responded to to thoughts uh, that go through the the mind very, very quickly. Thoughts, images, photographs, names, this is what we call the affect heuristic. These things that that uh, that our senses bring to our attention uh, are are we call them tag. There's like affective tags that they're they're linked to. They cause feelings uh, in us, and 
And so those feelings are there. And then we've got the scientific information and which way do we go. And, and, and a lot of that has to do with, with trust. You know, the easiest thing is to trust the scientists, to trust the, the regulators of the technologies of the products. If we have trust with, uh, and, and they tell us it's safe, we don't have to worry. We can go about and do things that are more fun. We don't have been sitting around worrying about uh, whether we should eat this this uh, food that looks that looks good and that we like, or whether it will you know, harm us in you know twenty years or something. We don't want to have to do that. We just want to enjoy and do our you know live our lives rather than think about all these risk issues. But but if we if uh, we have some evidence that maybe we can't trust them. Um, you know that they're really uh, the the companies that bring us all these wonderful technologies and products are really more interested in in uh, their profits than in in bringing us uh, safe products. Then we have to get our defenses up, and and we start to you know it's it's very very problematic. So the issue of trust is uh, is important uh, as well. So there's no there's no right answer. You can't necessarily say that. We always should look at science and, and, and put our feelings aside, make sure we don't let our feelings, you know, our emotions make us irrational. There's a sense that people used to say that, that emotions make us irrational. You know, where, where does that come from? Well, it's the sense that we know that sometimes that people who, have, uh, who are very angry do things that they later regret. You know that 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 the emotion of, of of extreme anger compromises our rational sense, and and we we do stupid things. So emotions are bad. Well, no emotions. You know we have emotions because most of the time they were essential to survival. You know, uh, and so uh, just like you know the heuristics. I mean, they 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 work. They have a a purpose. And the same thing with with uh, with our, our feelings. So I distinguish between an emotion, which is this strong, visceral sense that, you know, affects you f- physically, your, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, you know, your, uh, versus what I call affect. Affect is, uh, I call a, a faint whisper of emotion. It's the sense that, that something is not right. You know, if something is, you know, something's good or bad, you're, you're not in an emotional state when you think about whether something is good or bad, or even whether, whether something deserves anger. You, don't have, you can think about something that, that is, uh, deserves anger, but you're not in an, a, sen- a state of anger. You're just sort of sensing the negativity the, the, you know, through your feelings. And we call this the affect heuristic, the reliance on feelings as your compass. And so with regard to something like... Uh, uh, vaccinations. You know, if you see, if you if you read a story uh, about a parent who vaccinated their child, and the child right after that got autism or something, you, you know, that, and and you see that connection, that that's a strong, uh, uh, you know, a connection that creates a negative um, association with vaccinations, which very, is very hard to to over overcome there unless you trust. The, the uh, manufacturers of the vaccines, the medical medical community, if you trust them, then then it won't have that that impact. So so uh, a lot of times trust has to do with uh, whether one can can experience the positives and negatives. A, a lot of the, the good things that happen are are invisible. You know, you only see things when they fail. Uh, and and so uh, for example, uh, a lot of people opposed nuclear uh, nuclear power and we started to look at that in the 1990s I mean people uh, in the United States we haven't allowed new nuclear power plants since I know right 1970s we were a very anti nuclear power uh, society uh, we have a hundred reactors but it's been hard all those are old reactors and and we, we basically are anti-nuclear anyway we asked people what's the first thing that that you think of when you hear the word nuclear power. And we found, this was in the 1990s, a significant percentage of people, the first thought had to do with bombs, you know, with atomic bomb, with, or they would say a mushroom cloud. You know, so the word nuclear triggers an I- image that's linked to the origin of, 
of this technology, which is in, unfortunately in, in the bomb, and it creates negative feelings. That and we found that if a person uh, had that association, they were more likely to be opposed to the nuclear uh, power technology, even though this is nuclear power, not nuclear uh, bombs. So that's kind of the way the mind works. It's got these associations uh, in it, and and even I mean even scientists. Uh, are influenced by their 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 feelings. The uh, toxicologists who study the the risks and benefits very scientifically of of chemicals, they also have a sense that some chemicals are good or bad chemicals, and that influences their their interpretation of evidence. And and when you when you look to see how the experts uh, come up with their conclusions, some some of the sometimes they they struggle as well. So, so, for example, our, our chemicals, uh, the, the exposure to very small amounts of chemicals in food, air, water, you know, it, uh, is, is it safe? Very difficult question to answer. So what the toxicologist uh, does is to expose, you know, laboratory animals, rats and mice, to high levels of this chemical for, for the lifetime of the animal. And then they look to see if, if that, there were uh, uh, tumors or cancerous tumors that uh, occurred uh, as a result of this exposure compared to some control group that didn't get this exposure. And then they say, okay, now if they see this, this is a warning sign. And then they try to project what that means for a human, different species exposed to a very tiny amount of this chemical uh, uh, for a short period of time. And, and, and so they, 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 they create a, a mathematical model that tries to lead them to predict from the high exposures to the low. Well, okay, that's, is that accurate or not? You know, a lot of people would say well, that, that you, can't, you can't do that, that, that uh, prediction. It's, it's too different. Um, so there's conflict even within the, the science in terms of the validity of of, of, of the methods. So, uh, so the scientists are, are trying to help us understand a very difficult question, which is the exposure of, uh, to small amounts or to GMO foods, you know, which again creates small changes in a, in, in a, uh, a plant uh, product. You know, how do, you, how, do you, how does science determine what the long-term impact will be? Not it's not obvious. So it's not so naturally. People look to they would like to trust the scientists, but if they hear a report about a a company that's producing these GMO um, uh, products that is doing something uh, illegal and in, in order to maximize their profits, then suddenly they they get defensive, which it, it makes sense. Again, that's a feeling response, which is not irrational, you know. Uh, and we we saw we see a good in, um, a, uh, a very st striking example of that uh, a few weeks ago with the uh, the airplanes you know the uh, the Boeing uh, 737 Max systems which we had the the accident a few months ago in in uh, Indonesia a new plane brand new plane which plunged in the uh, sea and then we have another a a a accident just a few weeks ago I think it was in Thailand. The same plane, kind of plane, the same kind of failure, and it looks as though there is a, you know, the automated system, uh, which, which attempts to protect the plane from uh, uh, ascending uh, too steeply and stalling. Um, you know, there's a sensor on the uh, that looks at the angle that the plane's going with, and if it's too steep, it forces the nose down so it doesn't stall. Well, the the sensors. There was a, a, a flaw in this system. The sensors were sending the wrong data. It's like the feeling system sending the wrong data to your brain, you know, and leading to a, a, a correction that, that in this case was catastrophic. So, so then the question is, then you start to look at how did the, the manufacturer respond after the first one of these? Did they, you know, did they quickly, did they take it, quickly uh, fix it? And it looked like they, they did not act optimally you know, on the basis of this first thing. They were too slow and, and they didn't and they didn't train pilots or even inform pilots adequately about it. So now you see that the management of this or the response to this by the manufacturer and by the regulator 
was not what it could be. And that sort of shakes your, your trust a bit. And people right now, I think, you know, not only would uh, it might be uneasy about flying in these planes, but they, this, this uh, reflects on Boeing, the, this fantastic company which makes these incredible machines. They too are in jeopardy of becoming stigmatized by, by the thought that they didn't do the right thing here. And, and that's a feeling response. You know, and they can show a lot of statistics out. Most of the time, their planes work, fortunately. But uh, but again, even these these couple of examples shake people's confidence in the system, and and people respond. Well, that's not irrational. Uh, I mean, it you know, it depends. You know, if they do correct it and it's proven that it's corrected, and people still don't you know, do it, well, that's a you know, you can question that. But you see how complex risks risk is from the scientific standpoint and from the way our minds react to these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, one of the things you referred there when you talked about uh, plane crashes and things like that, you were referring to one of the phenomena that we refer to as the availability heuristic, right? That, I mean, when people are exposed to certain things with a certain frequency, like, for example, if they are exposed to a plane crash, uh, 100 or more people die at the same time, but perhaps in a car crash, only one or two or three or four die. And so when they are exposed to those sorts of events, it's easier for them to stick in their memory and perhaps they overreact to low probability events and discount the really high risk events and perhaps the same thing happens with things like uh, terrorist acts where really in terms of percentage very few people die as victims of them but people really overreact to them because they have blood and they have corpse and they have bombings and and things like that and and many times in the media they depict them in a very th a theatrical way or something like that so I mean uh, that, that's also another thing that really affects how people ju judge risk, the ways they are exposed to certain information and also the frequency uh, that it appears, for example, I in the media and perhaps we could also include social media that perhaps nowadays uh, contributes to exacerbate that effect, right? A absolutely. The availability. I mean, notion is the, the ease with which we can, uh, we can think of, we can remember past events or we, we have, uh, we can, uh, Think of uh, of the images of this uh, this thing happening. It goes back again to the electric shock experiment, where where the experiment made available in people's mind the possibility that they would suffer a shock. So they were again thinking they had an image of getting shocked, uh, and then that that and that conveys feelings, which becomes the representation of risk for them. It's that feeling, and we see that that feeling isn't isn't. Uh, 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 regulated very much by how likely something is, you know, unless you have overwhelming, you know, experience which shows you that it, it, you know, it really doesn't happen, and then, and then things can, your feelings will gradually uh, adapt to the fact that it's not happening. But uh, so, uh, so in all these different ways, the images, the availability was the was the first sense we had that that uh, that memory and imagination was linked to our sense of frequency and risk. Now we see that, that another aspect of that is when you, when, you, uh, when you imagine something happened or you remember it happening, it, it is conveying more or less uh, feeling, uh, affect, or other kinds of, or fear. So, so not only are you thinking a, about something which is made easier if it's in the newspapers a lot, but also it, it is in some cases conveying a strong negative uh, feeling, which then is a representation of risk. So, so the the feelings amplify the effects of the availability heuristics. It works together. We didn't we didn't see that at, that at first, although we did we did notice that uh, that uh, sensational causes of death. We did a study in 1978 that 
based on availability, it showed that that the the more uh, uh, kind of sensational media coverage there was led to kind of an overestimation of the likelihood uh, that this uh, this kind of event would happen. So that was the first hint we had, but that was early in our before we really appreciated the role of of, uh, of feelings uh, here. Uh, it took us a while. We we uh, uh, the way we we really started to appreciate the role of feelings was when we asked people to judge the risk and the benefit of different activities like flying in a plane or um, uh, taking a, a prescription medicine, how, how beneficial are medicines, how risky and so forth, or, or pesticides, how beneficial are they, how risky. And we've, we found that people's judgments of risk and benefit went in opposite direction. If something was high in risk, it was judged low in benefit. If it was judged low in risk, it was judged high in benefit. That, that there was this inverse relationship when in the world, risk and benefit tend to go together positively. You know, that, that uh, things, things that have, have uh, high risk but low benefit, we, we, uh, we get rid of those. Uh, we don't want anything that, that, that exposes us to risk without a commensurate benefit. So it, across different activities, in the world, risk and benefit go together uh, positively. In people's minds, they went together negatively. And we later learned, it took us a while, we didn't think much about it, and then we started to think, well, let's try to understand that. When we studied it further, uh, we found that the reason they went together negatively was that people first relied on how they felt about the activity. You know, did they like it or did they dislike it? And then they judge risk and benefit consistent with how they felt it. So if I if I if I uh, so so if I don't like pesticides, uh, they're they're the bad uh, bad form of chemicals. I would judge them as high in risk and low in benefit. If I see medicines as beneficial, then I judge them as high in benefit and low in risk. You even though pen, uh, medicines can have harms and pesticides can have benefits, we we have a our our brain in, puts a more simplistic frame that things that are, are good have to be high in benefit and low in risk, even when they're not in the world. So then we started to appreciate that's what led to us, led us to think about what we call the affect heuristic, yet another one of these many heuristics, which uh, Kahneman and Tversky said was one that they missed. They got availability bias representative heuristic, but they, they, they didn't think about the affect heuristic. And I think uh, I, I'm biased, but I think the affect heuristic is, is one of the most uh, important uh, 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 things to understand about how, how our minds process information when we're, uh, particularly when we're thinking fast. Mm -hmm. So I guess that one of the most pressing issues that we have in uh, at hand right now is climate change. So and people are saying that we have sort of a eleven year. A window to try to really tackle it seriously otherwise we will get to a point where we will start getting irreversible uh, climatic effects or environmental effects so uh, climate change also has the the additional problem that it really seems like something that will happen very far in the future and so it is very easy for people to discount it as a problem and a risk right fortunately yes right uh, <laughs> uh it's uh it's uh, our, our our brains didn't evolve to uh, help us uh, make decisions about something like climate change, which is very slow, uh, 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 gradual. Uh, it's not directly uh, visible because, and, and it has many components to it. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, not any one single thing that we can observe uh, suddenly changing. I mean, the climate has always been changing. I mean, that, and weather, weather changes, weather changes, climate is, you know, how does weather relate to climate? Weather is what we see right around us and, 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 and what we experience. We experience weather. It's uh, experiencing climate is more subtle. It's the, it's the weather over a lot, some large uh, amount of time and in different uh, types of, of outcomes. You know, it's much more complicated. 
than whether it's a hot or cold day or whether it's snowing or not or whatever. So, so um, um, that's hard for, for us to, uh, to, to appreciate the, the, small, the small changes because we don't, we don't experience it uh, directly and it, it's against the background of constantly variable weather. And, and, and it's not just in one direction. Climate change is not, we talk about global warming, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it only warming. And we see the, it's extremes. What, it, the climate change means extremes, uh, hot and cold, uh, precipitation and drought, uh, you know, violent storms, or, you know, things like that. It's, it's all these things which, uh, which don't directly um, trigger this experiential uh, concern, the, the sense that that we are vulnerable. What we also see in, in this research, risk research, is that you have to have a feeling of personal vulnerability that, that to maximize your likelihood that you'll do something. And, and many of us don't feel uh, vulnerable to these uh, changes because, as you said, we think that they're still far away in time, you know, it's, uh, and far away in places. You know, this is going to happen somewhere else a long time from now. And I've got more important things to worry about, is one thing. So, so, uh, so it doesn't trigger that that negative feelings uh, that when you when you look analytically at what the world is going to, what are all the consequences that are going to happen? I mean, they're more kind of like theoretical. They appear theoretical to us. And then, and so then, when you get the information, you get the scientific data. So you see that suddenly. Uh, the uh, the scientists uh, predict a certain um, uh, increase in in sea level rise, you know, ten or twenty years from now, you know, and they give it to us in you know millimeters or centimeters. What does that mean? You know, it, how do we how do we uh, understand the consequences that will you know the, uh, carry uh, that will will occur there? It, it doesn't, and so it so it doesn't convey uh, feeling. And when information doesn't convey, convey feeling, we don't really understand it, and it doesn't motivate us to act. So, so one way then is to, to make this experiential is to say, well, if you are one of the many uh, millions of people who live along a, a coastline, you know, uh, here's what this uh, sea level rise will look like on your part of the coast. You know, and and you then uh, make projections of the water coming in, and and uh, you know, uh, over you know, flooding out places that you currently live, or places where you go to recreate, or or where uh, you know cities are located and they're now uh, you know uh, being flooded out and so forth. So you, you you create you create consequences that are, have images that carry feeling. That will be a more powerful way to communicate than just by the by the numbers. Now we know that again because the feeling system doesn't do numbers; it reacts to images. So give people images, and, and we can do that. We can we can you know with we have ways to you know design visual <laughs> uh, scenes that are that are that are faithful to the to the science and so forth. And the same thing we, when we noticed about the the numbers, we we looked at the uh, at uh, the death toll in Syria and the Syrian war, which started in 2011, uh, where there was uprising against the government of Syria, uh, and the government cracked down viciously. They say, "Well, we're going to stop this," you know, and they started to to uh, to uh, to murder protesters and or hang them, do really violent uh, re- you know, to people who were protesting the government, and then that escalated, and suddenly there was kind of a all-out attacks uh, by the government on people who were opposing the, the government, and and um, it just started in 2011. By 2015, there had been like 250,000 uh, deaths in this conflict, a uh, high percentage of them civilians, and uh, so that was the numbers. And I, I'm not going from sea level rise in numbers to the number to 250,000 deaths. No one cared. And how do we know? I mean, you could see that there wasn't anything going on politically to try to intervene and protect these people. But also, if you look at at uh, at the uh, at the number of people searching on Google under the search term "Syria and refugees," it was low and flat. 
And then suddenly, uh, one day in September 2015, all that changed. And you see a tremendous interest in Syria and refugees. What did it? It was the picture, the photograph of a little boy on the beach, you know, uh, fleeing with his family, trying to get to Turkey, and the boat capsized, and the little boy and, uh, uh, was lying there uh, face down in the sand, Alan Kurdi. That picture went around the world. It grabbed people emotionally, and suddenly people woke up uh, and cared about what was going on in Syria and with, this re and with refugees in ways that the statistics of 250,000 deaths didn't move them. So it's the same thing. The data on climate change as data isn't moving us. We need to see it in terms of consequences uh, and, and uh, in order to, to appreciate it. So I'm very pessimistic that, uh, that we're going to, to uh, do anything. Uh, you know, it's already late in the, in the, in the game on that. And I think we're going to continue to under, underreact. We're underreacting to this threat because it doesn't uh, stir our, our feelings and emotions like it should. And the science is there and the data are there. But we're not we're not reacting to that viscerally, and and it's just it's starting to happen. And of course, the more things do start affecting us, then we will react. But you know, we should be acting way in advance of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just ask you two more general theoretical questions about all of what we've been talking about during the interview. Uh, and the first one, uh, picking on what you've just said about how when people were exposed to the number of deaths in the Syrian conflict, uh, they didn't really uh, care that much. And then suddenly when they were exposed to the dead body of that little child, Ellen Kurdi, on the beach, then suddenly they really started caring a lot or a lot more at least about it. Because, I, I mean, to what extent do you think that teaching people about these things, about biases and heuristics and the cognitive mental shortcuts that people have and that operate automatically in their minds uh, might be useful to try to counter uh, the negative effects that these things have on people's behavior and decision-making processes. Because I guess that from what you said, it seems to me that it would be uh, easier and it would have a much bigger effect on people if we simply perhaps change the environment and the ways we expose people to information, in, in a sense manipulating them a little bit uh, and tweak their systems in order, in order to make them uh, have uh, sort of appropriate reactions to things. Uh, because I, I'm also a bit skeptical that simply uh, teaching them about these sorts of things and how their mind operates, that, that really would have an important uh, positive effect on them. Also because we have mechanisms like the bias blind spot where people that even know about uh, these biases and heuristics uh, they arrive at a point where they think that they are no longer subject to them <laughs> and then they might also be even more under the influence of them because they don't notice their effects or something like that. I think that, that the first step has to be to create awareness of how our, how we think about the world in, in this regard that uh, uh, there's no guarantee that that by uh, educating people starting at a young age uh, into about the ways that our minds both benefit us and and mislead us um, you know there's no guarantee that suddenly the whole world will be transformed and but but I, I think you have to, it starts with awareness. And then the question is, okay, 
in some cases, awareness will might change people. I mean, this is just like, you know, teaching people uh, to, you know, to be moral, to be kind, to be compassionate, you know, to, um, this was happens every day and, you know, every week in religious uh, institutions where people are taught basic principles of how to be good to each other and make the world better. Well, that's in a way kind of to, to de-bias evil and greed and other things. Well, it does, it obviously, it's not, we still have these evils, but, but, but is, it, is it useful for billions of people to kind of worship in some way that tries to uh, provide principles to, to live by? Um, and I think it's the same thing with, with the, uh, the way our minds work. I mean, what, what could be more important to understand is how our minds work. And and, and 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 in ways that we may not be um, that may not be obvious to us. A lot of this stuff is very subtle, and we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't think of it if uh, research hadn't identified this. And then suddenly, now we know about it. Well, let's let's use it. I mean, w one example that comes out of our we, this arithmetic of compassion. By the way, we have a website devoted to educating people about arithmetic of compassion. Um, is the fact that that if you have a chance to help someone, uh, the, and, but, and you might do it or you might not, depending on your ability to help them, but you know, you, you have this opportunity to help. And then suddenly uh, there's some negative information comes in, either about people you can't help or about something else bad in the, going on. That negative information comes in and makes you feel less good about helping the child or the person and you don't help. So we help others not only because they need our help, but because we feel good and we expect to feel good when we help. And what we find is that that irrelevant information that has a negative affect comes in and and is not blocked out by the brain. The brain lets all sorts of, of uh, you know, of sensory information in uh, to blend in with the relevant information and it, and it messes up that rele relevant information. You don't feel as good about helping this child when you become aware that there's other children you're not helping. And so then you don't help the child, even though you can help that child. I say that's not rational. I mean, you should not be uh, uh, demotivated from doing good that you can do just because there's other things that you can't do. So I think people need to know about that. And and be educated about that so they can be on guard not to, you know, to think about doing what they can do and not to be demotivated by things they can't do. Now, that's a principle. Can we teach that to children? I think you can start teaching that to young children um, at an early age so that they're sensitive to the fact that you focus on what you can do and, and you block out. You have to work to block out the fact that, you, you know, that what you can't do, that's not relevant. Think, things like that. We don't know. We have to try and see if we can educate people to overcome certain of these these reactions, which I think are not, uh, I would say, are are truly non-rational. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just one last question, and this is an interest of mine because I've been having a lot of evolutionary psychologists on the show. So when we talk about these biases, like the confirmation bias, the and the heuristics, like the availability heuristic, the effect heuristic, and things like that, uh, I'm not sure about if there's lots of cross-cultural variation in terms of the extent to which people are affected by these biases and heuristics, and even if there are certain people that don't experience them at all. I'm not sure about that. But do you think that it is possible to talk about them with the evidence that we have as human universals? That is, uh, do, do people in general have these biases and heuristics? And if so, do you think that it makes sense to uh, deal with them as being uh, mental mechanisms or cognitive mechanisms that are the result of natural selection because probably during our evolutionary history they were useful to us. I hesitate to say that any of this is completely universal across the vast 
uh, diversity of, of uh, human uh, human culture and experience. Um, uh, I don't, and, and it's. Uh, I don't think we have adequate research uh, that that uh, you know in different in different uh, cultures to to demonstrate that something is truly universal. And we know that culture is, is a very powerful in, uh, influencer. And so, for example, some cultures are uh, 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 more uh, collective in their orientation, and they look at the welfare of the group. Um, and others are. More in, I think our culture uh, in, here in the West is very individualistic. We you know, and we we uh, um, put the individual well-being uh, often ahead of the uh, well-being of a, of a larger group. That's a that's a cultural difference that could affect the way we react to the, this function about the psychic numbing. You know, maybe the, the collective people are are less less uh, susceptible to numbing when there's a lot of people at harm than than we are. I think this is a research question, and, and it's it's hard to do this research uh, cross nationally, cross culturally, because you have to have uh, people in different, you know, working with you. You have problems of translating materials, of it, you know, and 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 it's just it's just not as easy to do that research. So I think I think a lot of this work has not been done. So I would say that there is there is likely uh, cultural influence that we need to be uh, uh, aware of that possibility. Uh, I don't know how universal some of these phenomena are. Um, maybe they only affect uh, 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 two billion people on the planet instead of six people. Yeah, perhaps the weird people, as you call them now in social psychology, right? Right. So uh, we do know, you know, how they. Uh, we do think that that they're fairly universal in within certain cultures where there's a lot, large number of of, uh, of people uh, that are affected by it, whether it's even if it's not everybody, it's still, you know. So again, I think that's an open question that uh, you know, needs further study. Mm -hmm. Okay, very well. So, Dr. Slovic, just before we go, you made reference to your website, The Arithmetic of Compassion. What other online sources could people go to to learn more about your work? Uh, well, that that source uh, does show a lot of uh, recent work on compassion, but uh, our organization, Decision Research, has its own website, just decisionresearch.org. Uh, uh, and if you go there and you look uh, there, it shows it gives publications. It gives for not only my uh, me but others in our organization. Uh, I think it's easy uh, it's easy to uh, get access to my work on the uh, on the internet, and I'm happy to. Uh, to provide uh, materials to send people, whatever papers we always, uh, we don't do uh, proprietary, you know, uh, private work. We we make uh, everything we do is, uh, you know, uh, available. Uh, we make available to the whoever's interested. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the video so that people can go and check those sources out. So, Dr. Slovic, again, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us on the show. It was really a pleasure to everyone, and maybe in the future we could do another conversation. I don't know. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was my pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I would be happy to consider future uh, discussions. Th thank you very much. Hello everybody, thank you so much for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel on February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You also have the alternative of supporting me on Subscribestar or Paypal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Geline, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jan Haninen and my two producers, Zizar Weber and Rosie. Thank you for all.